let's uh, let's just that. start out with a <laughs> with a preface, Cyril. Uh, yeah. All right. You've had a full and distinguished career as organist, church musician, composer of music for the church, conductor, and teacher. What first interest you interested you in church music? Uh, that's a good question. I, I I think because I was in a pageant, I played the part of David in a in a pageant at Trinity Church here, and I had they allowed me. To, they want I had a piece of spotlight equipment that they would let me bring, and I was fascinated with you putting gelatin in the spotlight for them, and <laughs> and uh, I remember pulled the whole thing over on the floor as I went up the aisle and so on. But at any rate, this exposed me to certain church music there at Trinity, and so that was sort of the I think that's how I probably got into it. I don't know. I never sang in a choir or anything. They mm. wouldn't even let me sing in choir at high school later on because my voice was so bad. I sounded like a young Louis Armstrong. <laughs> with whom did you first study, study organ? Uh, organ. Well, with William Gomp of Buffalo. He was, he was really my first organ teacher. I sort of taught myself before that. I'd studied piano before that, but Gomp was a, was a serious musician, and he insisted that I study piano for another two or three years before he really would take me on as a, as a, a serious student as, at organ, but uh, I was already playing, so he would let me practice on his organ in Buffalo there while, while he was teaching, you know. So you commuted from by. Binghamton? Well, for, we lived in Buffalo for about a little, about almost two years at, uh, back in 1930, it was, and uh, during the Depression. My father was in stocks and bonds. Well, his with uh, in a company from Philadelphia. Well, of course, that was washed out practically in the big crash. So we moved to Buffalo, and uh, so mother and dad decided that they would. Uh, it was about time they, you know, about time I. They decided something about my cur what, what I was going to do with my music, whether I should give it up or get with it. You know, and they didn't know too much about it. Dad had been a choir boy, and mother. It, and he'd studied piano, and, uh, you know, for seven years, and done all of his practicing with a catcher's mitt. And mother studied mm -hmm. with; uh, she studied a little voice, and she played a little piano. And they they didn't know anything about serious music. They enjoyed it, what they knew of it. Anyhow, they they fortunately got me with this this man who was uh, sort of the kingpin musician in Buffalo at the time. He was at Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church and had affiliations with the Wurlitzer Company where he was in charge of the role making department and so forth. That got me, that was an entree for me for the Wurlitzer Company, which fa that also fascinated me because I was fascinated with the whole world of theater and, and of course they had movie, or they had organs in the theaters in those days. And uh, they had a very fine theater organist in Buffalo by the name of Henry B. Murtaugh who was uh, even antedated Jess Crawford. He was mm. the, one of the first people at Mer that uh, Crawford ever heard play. He was from uh, out in Seattle. And at any rate, he, uh, I, I used to hear him at Shea's Buffalo Theater out there, and I thought that was just the most marvelous thing. I wanted to do theater organ. <clears throat> and I'd played a little bit of it here in Binghamton when, as a, as a kid, I'd taught myself, played at the old Capitol Theater over here, played junior fireman shows, you know, and <laughs> and uh, on weekends they'd let me play, and I even played with a couple of vaudeville acts that went through and so forth. And, but <clears throat> but serious organ music, I had I finally started with Gump after I'd been through the uh, the uh, two part, two and three part inventions of Bach and <clears throat> some. Mozart and Haydn and Chopin and so forth and Beethoven and <clears throat> finally I, I, he felt the piano background had come along enough so he could get me started with mm -hmm. some, some organ music. So that's the way it worked. Then we moved back to Binghamton and uh, as luck would have, first I went out every two or three weeks I'd go out for a lesson over weekend with, uh, with Mr. Gomp. I'd stay at his house with him and his family, <clears throat> and then they, he would take me to the train Sunday afternoon. Mother and Dad would meet me here when I'd come back. So that's the way I got going on that. And then I was just lucky in that he came to <clears throat> came through to Binghamton to be organist of the First Presbyterian Church. He was a great friend of Murray Shipley Holland, who was the pastor there. And uh, Holland had been his pastor at Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian in Buffalo uh, before he left, and Gomph and he were great friends. And, uh, the organist here at the time was a man named Francis Frank, who had done a good deal of composing and, and a very, very musical man. 
and was quite a good organist and excellent pianist. And uh, he went on. He was going off to uh, to another job up. Uh, I think it was up in Cortland. And then from there he went on to New York, and he was really interested in composition and so forth. Well, Gomp came at any rate uh, to Binghamton to fill that place. And uh, so, of course, I'd already had my contact with him, so I sort of became his, <coughs> his uh, unofficial assistant here. And finally they had my name on the leaflet. I thought that was great at First Presbyterian. So from you, you find the name in there from uh, leaflets from 1931-32 in there with Searle Wright assistant organist. Uh -huh. And uh, so we we broadcast from the church and so forth, did all sorts of things. And uh, I got a chance to play solos and uh, he, he got me going on Bach and I played all the wrong things. I remember that one of the pieces I wanted to play right off the bat was the Dupre Prelude and Fugue in B major, which is mm -hmm. a very difficult piece, I, I think. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I w spent a great deal of time, I finally got so I could play the Prelude, and he, he was almost angry about it. He said, you've wasted your time, but this is wonderful. He said, it's a marvelous piece, and it's marvelous that you can do it, but he said, you should be spending your time doing some more important things. He said, you can do those later. And uh, But I was glad I learned it then. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so he got me on the right track, and uh, he was the one that later on sent me to Tertius Noble to study. Well, he sent me, first of all, to Joseph Bonnet. When Bonnet came to this country, he was teaching at Boston mm -hmm. University one mm -hmm. summer. And there I met Catherine Crozier. And How old were you when you studied with Bonnet? Seventeen. Mm -hmm. And uh, Catherine Crozier. Catherine was, we were the two babies of the outfit. She was 19, and I was 17, and we've been friends ever since. But, uh, what composers were you especially enamored uh, other than uh, Dupre? Well, I, I liked anything that was, uh, at, at that, that time, I suddenly had a conversion to what, what I called modern music. I loved the air, and I thought that was marvelous. It had a uh, 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 marvelously eerie quality about it, you know, mm -hmm. some of these, these things played in the, uh, the intermezzo from the Third Symphony and things like that, and the... Uh, <clears throat> And then and, and Carr Gaylord also fascinated me in those days. And uh, uh, later on, it, I, I, it, the bug bit hard, you know. I got uh, mm -hmm. the more dissonant the music was, the better I liked it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but at the time, at the time, I really, really hadn't formed much of a musical taste. I can remember the first time I'd heard some Palestrina, and Mr. Gomp said, "Now this, this is great music." And I said, "What's so great about it?" I said. I haven't even studied uh, composition, but I bet I could write better than that now, you know, <laughs> with all the assurance of the of the completely ignorant. And uh, it just, I just, you know, there were all these these white uh, white and black chords, you know, just mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. one four five one, and and I couldn't understand why that was so wonderful. And uh, I thought Cargaylor was pretty dissonant too at the time. Then right then, as I say, the big big conversion mm -hmm. took place, and mm -hmm. suddenly it, uh, but I love colorful things, that was the point, I, anything that had to do with color, whether it was colors of light, I, I wanted to do, one of the things that fascinated me as a kid was the idea of being, having something to do with stage lighting, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. theatrical lighting, mm -hmm. and, uh, well, as a, as a performer now, yeah. you uh, at this time were you doing classical organ and theater organ? Well, I had played I had played some theater organ. I, I taught myself to play, and I'm, I'm, I must have played. It must have been atrocious what I was doing. But but you know the public doesn't know. The public doesn't mm -hmm. care. They it was this, it was this little kid sitting up there in knickerbockers, you know, playing this big white and gold console and the spotlight on it. What did Mr. Gong and, think? Oh, he thought, you're that's all right. He said, he said to my family, well, if you want to humor the boy, you know, let him go and study with Mr. Murtaugh. He said, Murtaugh is a good musician. And Murtaugh, as a matter of fact, had studied piano with Lechitisky, apparently. Mm -hmm. And he was a good musician, but he was, he was one of the first stylists, the people that really developed a, a recognizable style in his, in his matter of presenting popular music. Everything had to be arranged. Of course, there's no literature for the theater organ to speak of, uh, virtually none. There are probably a couple of dozen pieces that were actually written for the instrument, but you know everything else is an arrangement. You just take it and uh, and uh, lay it out for the instrument uh, for the that you happen to be playing and try to try to make it interesting. You know, and and uh, did you find any stigmas in the so-called classical organ community uh, in doing both? 
Well, of course, in those days, nobody, the theater organ people uh, were looked by the looked down upon by the AGO members at the time. You know that was that was supposed to be very lowbrow, and nobody, no proper musician. Well, of course, the the attitudes have changed now. I think they realize. I can remember one of the things that endeared me to Mr. Gum, for or endeared, endeared him to me, was was his saying that. Uh, there are only two kinds of music in the world. He said there's good music and there's bad music. And he said good music is that which is not dull. And he said, I don't care whether it's popular music or so-called serious music. He said it, it ought to be well made. It ought to be clearly presented. Uh, and with, uh, it ought to be a vehicle for some imagination, you know, and so forth. And... Uh, so he, uh, he, he was, I thought he took a very, uh, was very open-minded about the idea of my playing pop music, which I just did. I played by ear. I couldn't sight read a hymn tune properly until I was 17 years old because mm. I did everything by ear. Oh, I could pick out the notes slowly and find them. I knew where they were. But I simply had no, uh, 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 I really didn't, I, had, I hadn't developed an eye and the, 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 the whole train of, you know, of uh, reflexes hadn't built up, you mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I say, I I was a terrible reader, and he, he made me read through everything he could lay his hands on. We did opera scores, we did uh, piano reductions of orchestral scores, we did uh, uh, novelty pieces, terrible, any anything that we could find. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he made me take the old Henry Smart book of duets, you know, and I'd have to mm. play this thing. And then at the same time, I was supposed to either sing one of the parts, you know, while I played the accompaniment to it. And then I said, well, I can't sing. It's, my voice is cracked or something. He said, well, then whistle. So I, let, <laughs> I would whistle one part and he would sing the other. It must have been a great sound. This was over Old First Church. Yeah. And uh, anyhow, it was... Uh, Little by little, I grew find a guy so I could read, read music, you know, fairly decently. But what happened after you left uh, Mr. And oh, another other thing, he, he told me, he said, of course, you're going to get interested. He said, I would like to see you become a conductor. He said, there's the real thing. And uh, I said, oh, I, that wouldn't interest me at all. I wouldn't be the least bit interested. And I, I said, I don't even want to conduct a choir. Why, the whole idea of doing choral work, and I thought that would be a big bore. And, of course, everything he said, naturally, it, it worked out. I mean, as one grows, or one sure. white broadens out. And so all the, ver all the very things that he, he hoped would happen, uh, except I didn't wind up in a big position. But, <laughs> but, but well, at didn't least... Didn't he have a choral society? That well, he, he, he founded the Binghamton Oratorio Society. It was founded, as a matter of fact, it was started in 1934, for the 100th anniversary of Binghamton's, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the Corporation of the City or uh -huh. something. And they had a big wing ding out here on, uh, at, at the flats out by the river, and they had a, a, a festival chorus with 150 or 200 voices, which he'd gotten together. And we sang some a mixed program. It was very mixed. <laughs> Did you, uh, were you his assistant? For I that? was the accompaniment. I was the accompanist. <laughs> I was the accompanist for it. Yeah. And, uh, of course, everything. We had loads and loads of time, so I learned everything and played it letter perfect, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. then, then finally, they decided they liked the chorus and they wanted to keep it going. And I think it was turned into the Triple Cities Festival Chorus. And I was officially the accompanist for it, and so I would, he would tell me what we were going to do the following. We started in work on the Elijah. And... Uh, so I'd play it to learn a couple of choruses, you know. And then he would say, now let's just, people, let's just read ahead a, a couple of choruses here. And I'd just go absolutely white. I thought, oh my God, I've got to, you know, now I've got to sight read this stuff. So I'd fumble away and he'd say, I'll never embarrass you, my boy, at rehearsal. And he did every time. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, you, uh, well, after <laughs> you, you learn by... Yeah, becoming embarrassed enough. Well, after you left, Mr. Goff, uh, what uh, what about education there? Well, then I went on. I, I was going to Albonay oh, after I'd studied with him. He wanted me to come. <laughs> that was purely private work with Bonnet. Yeah. Well, I started out doing class work, and I was so scared that for the very first piece, I was going to play the fugue in G minor, the Bach Big Fugue, which I had no business playing at the time, but. Uh, uh, somebody had already played that, and so I had to play. He said we were going to do the fantasy and fugue that day, and I thought I was all equipped for it. 
But, oh, no, I know. Somebody, I was going to play the fantasy, but somebody else played the fantasy. I don't know whether it was Catherine Crozier, who it was, played it beautifully. So I came up for the fugue, and I was so excited. I started the thing an octave too high, and he said, tut, 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 tut. and I, what have I done? I hadn't played anything. And he said, move down an octave. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, it was terrifying. <laughs> But at any rate, I, I did do the class work, but I called Mr. Goff right away, long distance, to, called Buffalo, and asked if we, I wouldn't do a thing without his permission, and asked him if it would be all right if I'd study privately with Bonnie, because I didn't think I had the courage to do the lessons, to pl make a fool of myself every time. And I sat there and sweat bullets at the console, and all the students were sitting over about 20 feet from me in the other side of the balcony. I could just see them shaking away. They were having more fun at my expense. Gee. Well, but what about uh, T. Tertius Noble? When did all that Well, happen? I was supposed to go. Gomph had said, well, you were going. He said, now, in the fall, you will go to New York, and you will start studying with Tertius Noble, and you will go to college and do so and so. And... Uh, so I had told Bonnet what my plans were after, and he said, uh, oh, don't, he said, I, he said, don't ever tell anybody I said so, but he said, Noble, he does, he, he does, he's not, not, uh, well, I do not consider him a fine organist. And uh, that was the first I'd ever heard of that. I'd heard Noble was the kingpin in this country. Well, of course, the point was he wasn't French school, you see, oh, and uh, yeah. Bonnet, it, it wasn't, wasn't approached in the same way. And so when I finally, uh, but I did what Noble, what uh, Gompf wanted me to do, and I did, I finally went, to, oh, Bonnet said, why don't you come to Paris and study with me over there? We spent, spent a year studying, and you will learn rapidly. And he said, you have already learned a good deal in a few weeks here. And uh, I thought that sounded very attractive, but I didn't know how. And Mr. Gompf said, well, that's very good, very nice. But he said, you can study with Bonnet another time. But he said, uh, you're going to New York and study with Noble if he'll take you. Well, we had some exchange of correspondence. Noble said he would, would talk to me and see me, and he probably would take me. So I went down, and right away he, he started in about musicianship. Well, can you, uh, how, how, can you read a trio? Can you read an open score? Can you, uh, have you ever had orchestration? Can you do a, a figured bass? Can you play unfigured bass? Can you harmonize the melodies? I, and I thought, well, I guess, I, might, I guess I'm going to Bonnet after all, you know, because I sure figured, well, I said, I'm afraid I can't do any of those things. And he said, good. He said, then we, we know where to start. <laughs> so that, that was the, the end of that. But later on, Bonnet came through to New York uh, the following year, and I did study ornamentation with him. I was, was quite enamored of a good deal a number of early French works, such as Grigny and so on, you know, replete with all this ornamentation. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see what he would do with them. And uh, I told Dr. Noble I would like to go. And he said, by all means, go up. He said, he said that's his specialty. You go study with him. And so I, I studied with him for a winter in New York while I was still working with Noble. And I would uh, go up to his apartment and, and uh, up in Midtown apartment. There he had a lovely place that was overlooking Central Park. And then I would rush back to the church basement and see if I could play the ornaments, and usually I couldn't. <laughs> but that's, uh, that was how we, uh, uh, we got going on this thing. And Noble was very open-minded about this. I remember later on I played a, what I considered a great deal of French music in those days, and then Messian came out, and I, was, I thought that was marvelous. So I, uh, Macyon was was already out, but I mean he came out in New York, mm -hmm. and and I remember playing, learning uh, the Nativity, and playing at one of the some of the early performances in New York, and uh, that God Among Us, or as Seth Bingham used to call it, the Wrath of God Among Us. But uh, that's amusing to hear to, to think of Bingham saying that too, because Bingham was was was. Uh, French through and through, you know, in his outlook, and had studied with Vidor and Vierne and all those people, and uh, loved anything to do with French music, but uh, that that God Among Us was just a little bit more than he could take at first, and then later on said, well, he said, it's marvelous how one can grow. I can remember a few years later saying that, that was how middle of the road that piece was, you know. And, 
where did you side. where did you study with Noble? Where where did you at St. Thomas? At St. Thomas. Yeah, Park. we did we did our lessons on the big organ. Then we had a little tracker organ, an old uh, uh, Johnson organ in the basement that, mm -hmm. that we all uh, cut our teeth on. Mm -hmm. Paul Calloway and Andrew Teachin and all these people. Dan Philippi from from St. Louis and and. Uh, they, uh, they we so we that was the practice organ, mm -hmm. and we were also delighted when he finally uh, uh, we were uh, happy when when he decided to have Ernest Skinner electrify the thing, you know, so mm -hmm. that we didn't have to work so hard with it. It was a good tractor action too, but I've as I say I've never been uh, I've, I always felt if you can play well. Uh, it doesn't make much difference what action you've got. I mean, if it works, it's up to you to, to use what you've got. Of course, if the action is sluggish and, 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 and you've got broken wires or something, I mean, but if you've got a broken tracker, you can't make the pipe sound either. Sure. So. What about the uh, choral program at St. Thomas? Well, we used to do, we, we did the full treatment. It was like the old apprentice system in, in, in Europe or in, in England. Uh, when you went in, you d didn't just go for organ lessons. If you were serious about this, we, there were three or four of us, we called ourselves resident pupils. And we were there all, all half the day. We'd practice half the night, and we'd attend choir rehearsals regularly. And uh, uh, we, we were supposed to go to two, at least two or three of them a week, and we'd, we would play noonday services, and we'd turn pages, and we just did the the odd jobs around the place, and you you would co copy copy music and do all sorts of things, help get the program ready, and uh, you know you learn by doing, mm -hmm. and so this was uh, and it was something that you you know you know in, in school I mean you now they have courses and everything how to turn pages practically you know but in those days they you know you had organ technique and you had organ repertoire and you had choral methods and that was about it you know. But uh, to really get the feel of the thing, and then also the the relationships between the people, the secretaries, and the and the rector, and the and the assistants, and the uh, all of the uh, various people on the staff. I mean, this was invaluable experience what for was, anyone to get into the field. What was your impression upon hearing the choir at St. Thomas then? Well, it was, I, I, first of all, when I went down, I had never really heard any boy choirs. I had heard them on recordings. I'd, oh, I had heard a couple. We had one in Binghamton. They used to have one over at Christchurch here. And, uh, but I never paid any attention to it. I always thought, well, that was because they couldn't get a good mixed choir. That's why they had the boys. And in New York, I, <clears throat> to me, it was a cooler sound than I'd ever heard. I was used to hearing a great fiery sound from the sopranos wobbling their heads off, you know. And I can remember right away my choral, uh, choral uh, uh, tastes leaned toward what was going on over at St. Bartholomew's, where they had, of course, a mixed choir. And uh, the repertoire was, was something that I was more familiar with. I mean, I, <clears throat> I could hear the Verity Requiem and have my hair stand on end, or hear the Brahms Requiem. I wasn't very fond of Brahms, but uh, the Requiem was very beautiful. And... It was warm and moving and colorful, and then they did all sorts. They did what I considered modern music. Then they did a great many uh, 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 contemporary things at St. Barth's. And David Williams was uh, a, a marvelous accompanist and uh, could could get a tremendous line in the music and so forth. They did music where the, the, the where you needed a great deal of doing, a lot of romantic music, whereas Noble <clears throat> was doing a great deal of music from the well, Tudor period, you know, which of course I, at the time I didn't know at all. And I just thought, well, that's pretty cool stuff, you know, but later on, I, uh, I, I mean, nowadays I think I, I'd, I'd still be a bit torn if I had to make a choice and say take one or the other, but if I would be perfectly happy to spend my life among the Elizabethans musically <laughs> if I had a chance nowadays with a real first-rate boy choir. And <clears throat> of course, he had a choir that used to do that. They did all sorts of repertoire. They would they would do Leo Sowerby, and they would do the every year they did the Brahms Requiem, and he would do it over B NBC, and he would go into WEAF there with the old B uh, NBC orchestra. Uh, and he would conduct the orchestra and bring his choir. They'd do the Brahms Requiem, and one of his boys would do number five, the, uh, you know, and it was, it sounded just like, you'd sworn it, it was being done by a, a, a very fine soprano, a woman soprano, you know.
you know. Mm -hmm. Had all the warmth and the, the, the enunciation was, was, was perfect. The, the phrasing was sensitive. Uh, you just couldn't believe that this was being done by a little guy named Bud Gittins, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> who was finally killed as a, war, as a flyer in the war early on. But he was very gifted. And he, he, was, he was just in his first year at Columbia when he got drafted and went into the, into the uh, war. And <clears throat> but his voice lasted a long time. And Bud was just a nice kid who could sing anything. And then they would sing, I remember going in uh, at the time of the coronation in, in 37. Uh, they had a, a program. They weren't doing programs every day back and forth because we didn't have Telstar in those days. But they did have this relay system where they could, and BBC would send programs over here and we would send programs. And they did a shortwave concert with the orchestra, the NBC orchestra, and uh, Noble's Choir. I remember they did Zadok the Priest, which of course was part of the coronation ceremony, mm -hmm. the handle, uh, with the orchestra, which he conducted. And they did Maurice Evans, the famous Shakespearean actor, did some readings. And uh, B. Lilly, the marvelous comedian, you know, English comedian, uh, who was in New York doing a musical comedy, she did a very funny reading. And it was a variety show, you know, in, in honor of the coronation. And they, they wound up with the Holtz Te Deum with orchestra. Mm. And this was absolutely hair-raising. But the choir, the choir, his choir could do all sorts of things. And, of course, he was the complete musician. He could orchestrate. He composed tons of music, probably too much. But, uh, but mm -hmm. he, uh, it was well made, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> he, uh, and, and, of course, he, he idolized the composers like... Uh, and Gibbons and, and, and Bird and Ty and Wilkes and Tallis and all those. His idea of, of heaven was to just hear every day, to hear, hear the uh, Orlando Gibbons, uh, oh, oh Lord, increase my faith song, mm -hmm. you know, just, mm -hmm. just sing it through once a day and he would be happy. <laughs> Well, so uh, your English, your interest in English church music obviously then began there. Well, it kind of, yeah, that's where it grew up, and then of course I became more and more familiar with it, and I can remember the day when I was asked him who this Holst was. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, I, I was fascinated with this today, in which uh, one of the choir men down there characterizes having a little Indian in it, you know, <laughs> with all the the, the the timpani booming back and forth, tonic dominant timpani. And uh, at any rate, he he had uh, he was he and well, he and his wife were friends of the Holst, of Isabel and Gustav Holst, of course whom I had never met at the time. I never did meet Gustav because he died before, in 1934, but I did meet his wife before she died. We used to send flowers out from Columbia around Christmas time to her, to the, cable some flowers to her for Christmas, and she would send back a card, a little note, handwritten, and so forth. And then his daughter and I became good friends, Imogen Holst. Right, right. And, of course, in the meantime, the die was cast, and I was digging into all the modern... And, of course, David Williams did a great deal of, of modern stuff. Her I say modern, but... Na name some composers. Harold Dark, for instance. He did for th so many things of Harold Dark's, which still are not known today. For instance, Thou, O Lord, Thou Art My God. It was a huge anthem written with full orchestra for the Sons of the Clergy at St. Paul's Cathedral. This was back in the early 30s. And... Uh, I managed to get all the copies they had left from Oxford and bring them over here. And, mm -hmm. Oh, this was a number of years ago. But what other rate, composers did he do? Oh, there was Harold Dark. Then there was uh, there were people like uh, Lennox Barclay. And let me see, what else did they? Uh, oh, uh, Robin Milford, for instance. The Pilgrim's Progress of Robin Milford. It's a mm -hmm. marvelous piece. Did you ever hear it? Hear it? No. It's a good piece. It's... it's uh, a church cantata thing, but it's it scored for orchestra mm -hmm. or organ either way, and it works beautifully. Then there were a series of evening cantatas for regular evening service for just organ and uh, modest choir, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And of course, they sounded glorious at St. Barth's with the. And then David did, uh, uh, he did so many things. He would do uh, things, uh, big transcription things, uh, Kodai and. and uh, 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 Elgar, and uh, they did the uh, 
he's the first one I ever heard do the Dream of Garantius with just organ, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I finally did it at Columbia that way. I've still got a good tape of that, incidentally. And well, if I do say it was good performance. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned Columbia. Now, when did you go to Columbia University? Well, I went. I started when I was no, going to study with Noble. Um, Noble wasn't very great on people uh, wasting their time with a lot of academic nonsense, but my family, they wanted me to go to go to Princeton, where my father went, and take up electrical engineering. Dad had majored in political economy there back in, graduated back in Audi 5, <laughs> and uh, the people like Charlie Scribner and, and Norman Thomas, the old uh, um, oh, socialist, you know, candidate and so forth, and uh, but he had it was a very interesting class. Harry Emerson Fosdick was one of Dad's classmates, mm. for instance. Mm. And uh, at any rate, so they planned, and I remember remember they saying, "Well, it's all right. This music's all right, but what are you, how are you going to earn your living?" And I said, uh -huh. "I don't uh -huh. know." And uh, so, at any rate, they thought they better not stand in the way. They they helped me as much as they could, and uh, but they they weren't able to help me much musically. But Lord, I had marvelous moral support from them, and they, they certainly helped me financially, and so did my uh, uh, great aunt, uh, uh, who we lived in Chicago, and uncle. And uh, at any rate, I went to Columbia to get my academic work, to do BA work. In, and what year was that? that you oh, started? I, was, I started in the fall of 37. I was doing it in driblets. I started doing a couple of courses in university extension, and then I finally worked up to full full scale a schedule, you know, and uh, then I was finally taking master's work there, uh, and I had more than enough points, but I had almost had a nervous breakdown on this uh, one time. I'd, I was just trying to do too many things, and I'd, I'd failed a German examination, and I, I took the thing again, and I made it the second time I, I passed it. But at, at that time, I was just too too worn down to, to face another year of, of, of German, which I <coughs> felt that it didn't interest me very much anyhow. This was the beginning of the war, and uh, I was a little just turned off with the Germans. So at any rate, I uh, but I, I kept on there, and I was <laughs> there for about 10 years at the university. And uh, never actually took a degree there, but, but I had more than enough credits for it. If I'd only had all I needed was that one extra year of German, and I yeah. could have had the stuff given me. Well, it didn't make any difference. At least I had the, the uh, uh, advantage. And the, the one reason I wanted the degree for, uh, degrees from university was so I could teach in, in university, because I thought mm -hmm. that would be fun and be interesting. In the meantime, while I was still up there, I started teaching at Union Theological Seminary. I was called, Hugh Porter asked me to go over there. What year was that? And that was 1948. He asked me, first of all, to start uh, to, to take organ students for them. And I took them when I was down at Chapel of the Incarnation. I would have them come down there. and. Uh, so you had a church post at the chapel? Of yeah, I was there for eight years at the Chapel of the Incarnation. As organ on East 31st or? Street. Yeah. Uh -huh. And... Uh, then he had, uh, let's see, I, uh, I had the students coming down there. Betty Peake was my first.